people here actually saw the clean first time round? Seven. Right, that's what I thought. Oh, I never know what they cracked up to be, eh? The clean were just the pits, eh? They just, it was just because, you know, toilet up had broken up, talk walks hadn't really got going yet, the people thought they were okay. I'm lying for those of you who are unfamiliar with my unusual sense of humour. The first question is really the obvious one. How did this reunion come about? Basically through Craig Taylor who does Flying Nun in Europe, um, me and David Hamish were in London at the same time last year and he thought it would be a good idea if we um, just got together and played. And we just had one practice and then did it and it worked really well, we just did two gigs. What was the response like at that first gig? Um, well the first one was a sm small gig so it wasn't really advertised so that was a sort of warm up and the second one was the the main one, that was really good, there was lots of New Zealanders here, so it was, it was really good. How comfortable are you guys with the legendary status of the clan? Well, it's something we're aware of, but we don't really think about it or take it that seriously. Um, we just see it as that we really like playing together with each other and we play pop music and we've happened to be really successful. We don't really take it that seriously or think about it. I think it's probably best not to do it. one tour planned at the moment so we're not looking past that even if it is really successful we'll have to see what happens after that but we haven't got any plans to like get right back into it in a big way or anything like that. Because Robert and I, like I'm committed to my band Stephen and Robert is to the bat so um, it really is just a one-off thing. If anything happens we, it might be a two or three year thing that we do but it's a total one-off sort of holiday as far as you can look at it. For a while the clean were one of the bands that epitomised the unique of the sound. Do you think that sound has survived? Um, well, it's survived in the media anyway, and, and it's survived in some of the bands to a certain extent. Um, some of the bands are still playing uh, fairly loud guitar-based music, which we are to a certain extent, but um, a lot of that was built up by newspaper and, and TV I mean, and stuff. I mean, all it is is uh, a trebly guitar with a bit of reverb on it and pop music, you know, I mean, that's all it is. And that's all over the world, you know, not just the need of. But it has survived and it always will survive, you know, all over the world. You know. We've written our 30 new songs. We, we really love to be able to document the tour with these 30 new songs, maybe do an LP, um, if not an LP, uh, EP's worth. Um, so that, that's in the pipeline. We definitely want to do that. Um, other than that, that, that maybe a record that, that might be all at the time being. playing together again. I think we, we rediscovered that and we wondered why we hadn't continued to play together. And even though we're intermittent with what we do, I sort of see it as a continuum. We're um, all developing and playing music on our own separate paths, but when we come back together, we bring back to the thing we started, um, you know, what we've learned or whatever. So coming back together and playing together is a really good experience for us all. And this funny wee box called a small stone, which is made by electro harmonics, and uh, you just put the organ and the Hamish's vocals through that. I don't think a lot of people realise it's a vocal track on there, but that's Hamish singing along with the organ. The warble, strange warbling sound, yeah. I think we've been really um, affected by the 70s kind of revival thing that's happened too, and I think that's our late 60s, early 70s church rock instrumental. I 
think we've always, we, all of us have listened to a wide variety of music and we keep our ears open all the time. I mean, I live in New York most of the time now and I hear so much stuff on the street in terms of um, people playing on the street and cars and everything like that, with, you know, sound systems, but all that goes in, you know. And we've always chosen with the music that we play a certain approach that, you know, even back in the early 80s, I was listening to reggae and um, I've always been really interested in a lot of Afro-American music. It's just, I think, we're a bit non-trendy. We just haven't jumped wholeheartedly into grabbing on to particular rhythms with what we do. We've tended to work within an area we feel good about and it's expressive for us, you know. And also we had um, Alan Starrett, who was quite a multi-instrumentalist, playing with us who brought a lot of those instruments into the studio, like the dulcimer, the accordion, the viola, um, the cello. So, you know, Alan actually made the LP a lot more interesting because he was there, which was you know, pretty wonderful really to have him there. And also he left his dulcimer behind so we could attack it as well. So. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> Learning how to play um, new instruments like that. It's an appellation thing. It's like a mini piano, it's all strung up and you hit it with little felt hammers. And um, we both, me and David, both did a, a piece on different songs, and it was, it was great fun doing things like that. And it's all changed. I guess what a lot of the maybe what some of the Dunedin bands out of the Dunedin sound created was kind of like a white soul thing in a way. And uh, you've got to be kind of soulful with your rhythms in a way. You know, you've got, they've got to be things that are in you that sort of, you know, express you as a, as a white person, basically. So uh, it's just like totally feel orientated, you know? It's whatever, what's, it's what feels right for us is what's come forward and what we've produced, basically. So uh, I guess it's roots, white roots music.